Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Phil Boogie, and welcome to another episode of Isolation Be Like. I am in the studio slash car um, recording uh, tonight. Um, it's been a long week or so since um, I recorded last. When I started this podcast, we were at the beginning of this um coronavirus, COVID thing. And I was just needing a space to process my feelings around everything that was happening to me and my family and and, and everyone around me as we tried to um, figure out how to deal with this new threat, right? We were scared and confused and unsure what was going on. And then the news started coming out about uh, what demographics were being impacted the most in this country. And it was just a lot to take in. I just needed a space to talk about that. Like, that was the big news of 2020. Now, that was March, right? And here we are sitting in June, the beginning of June is June 1st. And that is almost no longer the big story of the year. Um, losing, you know, upwards of 100,000 people and um, most of the country being on lockdown at some point and hospitals being full and running out of basic equipment um, to care for people in the United States of America. That is no longer the big story, at least not this week. There's a rebellion, right, happening. There's an uprising happening because of the continued uh, mistreatment by the police against black people in this country. I specifically say black people and not black men because it's happening to all of us, right? Regardless of gender. Now, what I can't really wrap my brain around is just that we can't even be in the middle of a pandemic, a pandemic that is greatly impacting communities of color. We can't be in the middle of that and wrap our brains about how to heal and how to take care of ourselves in the middle of that and just process how to stay alive, um, how to keep our, uh, how to keep healthy in the middle of a pandemic. We can't, we can't even focus on that survival because we still have to shift as black people often do to surviving just day to day um, in a world where people look at us and think that maybe we're we're not we're not human right so that they can do anything they want to us So I'm going to talk about knowing your whites, right? And then also knowing yourself. You know, so the white folks I know, the white people who I rub up against are, generally speaking, liberal. A lot of them are in the arts. Um, the ones who aren't um, still have very um, sort of liberal leanings and kind of favor charities that I also support, um, have similar views. And the white people who I know who are Republicans are not conservative in the ways in which that we see that are now frightening and extreme, right? And I think a lot of the confusion around how to talk to each other comes from the fact that people don't know themselves, right? So people, you know, when they see their black friends sometimes are like upset about George Floyd or Breonna Taylor or Trayvon, things like that. They can understand that because it is brutal, senseless, and we can all, most of us can connect to that on some level. But I think sometimes there's some confusion about the rage that we feel on, the, on an everyday level some of which is inflicted upon us from the people 
who we consider friends that we absorb because there's an amount of everyday racism that we encounter just living our lives, right? That you can't spend your day fighting all day at work, at Starbucks, uh, at the Target, walking down the street, on the bus. You can't spend your day fighting all day. So you absorb these everyday sort of insults, right? And I'm just going to just give some examples about the things that, um, you know, because I just could not think of how to frame this conversation, but I I think I want to frame it from the fact that I am frustrated by what I see on the news. I am also frustrated by the fact that uh, because people see me and everything seems to be okay, there is an assumption that I am often not encountering difficulty because of my race. And there's also um, sometimes this thing that people in your lives will do, white people specifically, where when you're talking about race outside of the context of an extreme case like police brutality that is obvious, there isn't always an immediate understanding um, of what you're talking about. And sometimes it's dismissal. And let me be clear, when I'm dismissed like that by somebody who I consider a friend, they're not hearing me. I'm not even talking about agreeing with me, but if they're not hearing me, then we can't. We can't communicate. I, I I can't do that. I've done it before. I've tried to understand and I don't do that anymore. But everybody's looking outside. So what I want my white friends and white folks who are listening to hear is that part of the problem might be you. Not all of you. But a lot of you. When I was in film school, um, I had a white mentor. Um, One of my mentors was white, uh, a successful screenwriter who had taken me under her wing and um, was really pushing for me to sell a script. And one day told me there were some executives from Disney coming. Um, and she wanted me to get in front of them. And I had a script that was a romantic comedy set in a middle-class neighborhood um, with a middle-class family, two sisters, and um, they were African-American. And about a week before the executives from Disney came, she pulled me aside. Now, this is someone who was helping me, who supports me, and who I trusted. She pulled me aside and said, so just to be clear, these characters are are black, right? And I said, yeah. And I was a little bit confused by the conversation because clearly it said African-American near the character description. So I just said yes, but kind of with the question mark, because I'm not quite sure why I'm being asked this, this obvious question. And then she says, okay, well, I think the script can sell. I think you can make a lot of money. But the characters themselves are just sort of like regular people, just regular middle class, upper middle class people. And then I almost forgot they were black. And, you know, one of the rules that we kind of talk about in screenwriting is is use it or lose it. So, like, I mean, if if you want them to be African-American, I can understand that because, you know, you are. But if they're going to be that, use it. And I said, okay. I said, what does that mean? She said, well, if they're going to be black hip hop it up a little bit and the conversation went on she kept talking but i i I left kind of left my body at that moment if they're going to be black hip hop it up the script had nothing to do with um hip hop had nothing to do with being cool in a specific kind of way. I knew exactly what she meant. They were just being normal, whatever that meant to her. So normal, everyday people are white. Why make these characters black if you're not going to have them pop locking or rolling their eyes and necks and doing whatever she thinks 
being black meant. But she said, hip hop them up. Now, everyday racism, sitting there minding my business with this woman who is liberal, woman who has taken me under her wing, who has been kind with me. And here we are. She doesn't see or could not see the problem in saying that to me. Just just sitting there minding my business, right? That's part of the problem. You know, recently, um, part of an organization, um, an arts organization, where one of the staff members has continuously said racist things, right? And part of me is tired, right? So I confront the person once and just kind of check them. Like, And one of my favorite things to do is, is to say, what did you say, right? And make someone repeat it. So I did that, it's repeated. And then I kind of say, well, this is how I heard that. And we move on and I didn't make a whole big sting, but I just make sure that a person understands that I am, I am hearing them, I am acknowledging them. So it's not gonna be a surprise when at some point I actually go the fuck off, right? And I took it a step further and I reported it to another white person who I counted um, as a friend and was listened to and was heard. But in the end, um, the institution of that organization was more important, was more valued in my estimation than what was happening to the people um, who were worker bees, who were there holding the organization up, right? I would imagine that neither one of these people consider themselves to be agents of racism, but in my estimation, even if by silence, they were. Again, liberal, in diverse relationships with friends and other colleagues, all these things, still agents of racism, right? That uphold um, structures that allow people of color to be victimized, right? Again, these are people who we brush up against. They're not, they're not calling me a nigger. They're not threatening my family. Um, they've actually been really kind to me, right? But it's bad, right? You know, everyday, everyday stuff. Working in LA, work for a big marketing PR agency. My manager was a white woman. We had um, a pretty good relationship. And I started to, started to do very well at my job, was getting some notice from up above her in terms of hierarchy, got invited to a meeting with the president of the company. And I guess that caused some problems. And I was pulled into a meeting by this white woman who was only maybe a couple of years older than me, who I had, I believe, as much or more education than, and was told that anyone off the street could come and do my job and not to get too above myself. Came out of nowhere. We had not had any beef, nothing. But it was, again, putting me in my place, this liberal white woman who had befriended me and others, you know, putting me in my place. Racism. Again, not coming from somebody who is an extremist, who I feared would harm me physically, or who I think would spit in my face, or who I thought would like burn a cross on my lawn, but racist. Same company, same marketing agency. Knew I was talented. Um, and then when it was time to get accounts, I would get called to be the voice of what was cool and hip. Now, I was younger. I did have my finger on the pulse-ish. But I didn't want to be relegated to the Air Jordan account. It didn't even really make sense for what my interests were to be on Air Jordan and Patron because that was the hot drink in the hip-hop music videos and hypnotic for the same reason Alizé you know, and I would speak up about it. Why? Why me? You know, what does it mean when we're in marketing meetings and you refer to soccer moms 
And then, but you don't think that anybody else can be that kind of mom, that what you really want to say is that you're marketing to white, white women. So I would just say that because if you're going to be that, then, then be exactly who you are. But we got to get up, me and my other black colleagues, we had to get up every day and go into an office where jargon was used that sort of relegated black people to certain boxes and relegated Asians and Latinos and whoever else who was not white into some kind of um, separate box. And I would speak up on it and make everybody uncomfortable. That shit gets tired. And on and on and on. So for me, this discussion is about police brutality. It is about our, our country's history. But on a micro level, as our friends and people who are our colleagues are asking us, what can they do? My answer is to take a moment and think. Think about who you are. Think about the conversations you've had with other people about race or about certain issues and whether or not you listen to what people had to say. Think about if you are, are, are an, uh, an event planner or you do arts work and the only times that you invite people of color to participate in programming is when it's the Juneteenth celebration or Black History Month as if we don't exist throughout the whole calendar year. I want you to think about if you've been doing fundraisers for dolphins and whatever else, but haven't done one for the victims of police brutality that we all know about. Haven't done one fundraiser for that, you know? Um, you've done one for every sort of endangered species that exists you know, we all, you know, heard of something that went, and rightfully so, that happened for the children who were being detained um, along the border. We all we all supported that, and rightfully so, um, because it was horrible. But what about your, what about your neighbors who are suffering, right? And not just when the world's on fire, because we know about this stuff before the world is on fire. It's not a secret. You know, yes, I appreciate the Black Lives Matter sentiment coming from everyone, but you have to matter before the world is on fire. We have to matter when I tell you there's a problem at work because someone said something to me that was wrong and that you hear me and not tell me that that person was just joking or that person's a nice guy or that's a nice woman and, you know, they didn't mean it. We need to matter then, not just when somebody is murdered. And I know people may not see the connection to these things, but there is one. The connection is, is that it's really easy to see the problem in other people and to not see it in yourselves. It starts with us looking at ourselves. I do it. I do it. I check myself. We should all do it, right? And I appreciate what I'm seeing in terms of genuine protesters who are out there, who are not people of color, who are out there because they want to be out there, not because they're capitalizing or part of some other initiative to cause, um, to disrupt what's really happening. I, I like what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing. I think a, something has struck a nerve, but it, but if we're to move past this in any real way, if you're a professor, look at your syllabus. If every expert that you're suggesting to your students is white, you're part of the problem. If every book on your reading list is by a white person, you're part of the problem. I'm a storyteller. I perform for various storytelling organizations. 
Um, if every storyteller on your stage is white, most of the time, when your organization is in a multicultural, diverse city, part of the problem. Think about what you're doing. It could be done differently. It can be done differently. I am struggling with what's happening now because I, everything feels so big. I'm sitting in my driveway right now in my studio and it's quiet. There are no marches happening up and down my, my block. But it's, but it's very much present in my life, what's happening right now. I've been, I've been stopped when I shouldn't have been. I worry about what's gonna happen to my children and to my friends' kids and to my family members every day. I fucking come out to my, um, come out of my house to go to my car to do something around on, on my property. And sometimes I grab my wallet because my ID is in it because I live in a, a nice neighborhood. And I sometimes think that someone's going to see me walking around my own goddamn house and call the cops. That I even have to think about that is ridiculous. And that's not because of extremists. It's because of the good white folks. And I'm doing air quotes that you can't see that I know, that I live by. Right. I have a documentary called uh, Searching for Shaniqua. It's about how people get discriminated because of their names. You know, and at the heart of that is, again, it's racism that we can't or don't want to be identified because of something bad happening to us, because of how far away from whiteness, from the so-called center, we have moved by giving ourselves or giving our children names that are not approved by white people. Not extremists, everyday white folks. That then trickles down to everyday black folks who then live under that system and then force the oppression on themselves. You can't escape the shit. So my advice for all of us and for the people listening who are white is to start just with a silent sort of just meditation about the people in your lives and how you have shown up for them or how you have not shown up for them, right? I want you to think about the ways in which you're a teacher and haven't whether you have black students or not, haven't shared anything about people who are not white that have nothing to do with slavery or civil rights. Not that those things should be erased, but if you've not offered them anything else other than that, why? If you teach music and you're not talking about um, artists who are from the continent, from, continent of Africa and um, or a black artist, if you're not talking about anybody else but Europeans, you're part of the problem. Are you standing on someone's neck? No. But it's part of the problem. It's the part that you can solve. You can change that by yourself. You can change that. If you're hiring, and not because you're supposed to hire someone black or whatever, but if you're hiring and you never think about how your office ended up to be all white, you never considered, you never considered it, never thought what value it might add to have different people, what it can contribute to what, what you might be doing um, in terms of your, your business. You're a part of the problem. If people are coming to you telling you that racist things are happening to them, then you still expect them to work with those people and you're not doing anything about it. You're part of the problem. You know, I was a foster parent 
for a couple of years. And one day during a meeting, um, the attorney for the parent who, whose kid, um, whose child, who we had, was going on and on about feminism and going to the Women's March and about how she was out there for hours, white woman, on and on and on and on. And we got to stand up, change the world. And then sat in that fucking meeting and fought for this little black baby who we had in our home to go back to a home that was not stable. So you, you, you marched for hours because you saw the value in women's lives and the importance of standing up for people. But you could look at this infant and think it would be okay to send them back to an unstable environment, right? Because it's just what you got paid to do. I don't want to hear shit about you going to that women's march. Because what you're doing right now is your profession tells me everything I need to know about you. You're a part of the problem because these black lives, these black babies who you're sending back into unsafe homes, you don't give a fuck about. You are part of the problem, social worker. Part of the problem. Your racism is part of the problem too because you don't see these people um, who you're handling as valuable. Everyday racism. I saw it as a foster parent. See it as a teacher. Uh, you know, I teach students who come to my class who I have to sit with and work with, and they are fine students that I would never think as students who have any sort of problem. And then I hear other professors, other teachers talk about them, and I sometimes wonder, are we teaching the same student? You know, where they're seeing aggression from a student, it's not aggression, it is your fear. You are part of the problem. So... We can't fix, we can't fix all of this stuff overnight because it didn't happen overnight. But what we can do is just be honest about who we are. And if, if the honesty just leads you to the fact that you don't, you're not even sure who you are, then that's fine. But at least you're thinking um, about it. But what I know is that, that I'm surrounded by white people who I believe with my whole heart mean well. But at the same time, what I know, and it's very hard to accept sometimes, is that their intention to mean well does not always mean that they, that they can do it. Because it's hard to think of yourself as part of the problem. And I've given up on the this my 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 job, my my duty or responsibility of of listening to the guilt about how people, you know, didn't mean to say something a certain kind of way. I get it. I get all of that. We're all human. I fuck up all the time. I get it. But either you're with you're with me or you're not. And I'm just watching your actions, just watching your actions. Not what you say, just your actions. That's it. That is it. So, march, protest, post on social media, um, do all the things. And at the same time, to my black friends, um, understand it's not your responsibility to fix everybody and to to absorb all that shit all the time. Walk away. Um, you ain't got to fight every battle, right? And, and to and, and know that I understand the complexity of having white people in your lives who you know are good people and don't mean any harm. 
while still harming you. Right? It's easier said than done sometimes to talk about what you will do in those situations, right? Um, so I understand that complexity. And that's not, a, that's not an issue that a lot of us have to deal with. I don't recall my mother having white friends. So that wasn't her problem. But for those of you, I'm talking to people who, who do, like me. It is a complex issue, right? And to my white friends, the white people who, who hurt me the most have looked like you, every day, decent white people who have put me in a position where I've had to decide if I can still have you in my life when I've been blindsided by um, racist behavior. Not Confederate flag, not being called a nigga. Just you not showing up in a way that um, that makes sense to me, that feels kind, that feels loving. And not every person, but my point is that it, the people who I've had the problem with mostly have been people who I rub up against um, in congenial ways. So that that ought to tell us something. It tells me something, right? To stop looking so far away, to look closer. Let's look closer to ourselves. Let's still fight for the macro. Let's spend some time on the micro, though. Um, and I know some people are listening saying, not me. And I might argue, maybe, 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 maybe. And if you're listening and you want to know, if you're one of my people, you can ask. I tell you, I'm, I'm down to have a conversation. But beyond that, it may not even be with me. Just just know that it that you may have, you may have, you may have been part of the problem somewhere along the way and not even known it. It may still be um, part of the problem. Right now, I am, you know what? One more example. And then I'm gonna, I'm gonna go shut it down. And it's really, and I, and I want to talk about why this example is really important to me. It's because it's this whole thing of um, safe space that I think is bullshit. Um, and it gives people a false sense um, that what they're doing is correct because they say out loud, safe space. And then all of a sudden, that means everybody's on one accord. This is a safe space. No, it's not. It's not a fucking safe space for me. You know, um, I went to a retreat. And those of you who have heard me tell this story may know this. Um, but I went to a retreat about, I don't know how many years ago now, seven years ago. And it was a writing retreat for LGBTQ writers. It was a big deal. And I flew out to California. There were about 40 of us, 45 of us, plus some mentors. And there were a couple of people of color there. And I show up. I get called the wrong name. I get called by the name of another black person, by three um, uh, white um, writing fellows who were there, um, called me by the wrong name. Like the minute I showed up, I was called by the wrong name. And that set the tone, right? Because um, that's not my name. And why are you calling me that? And I find out that it was the name of another Black person. And then the next day at breakfast, I sit down. And this white woman who was a total hipster and does all this sort of equality, diversity work on behalf of gay people, um, I sat down at the table just trying to be like I'm just I just want to fucking eat breakfast right and if you know me you also know that I didn't want to eat with anybody I wanted to be by myself but you can't do that at a retreat when people are supposed to get to know each other so I sat down at the goddamn table to not be a weirdo I sit down with everybody else and she asked me a person who I don't know doesn't know what I eat don't know does just doesn't know me 
looks over and, the, and says, like the second I sit down, she asked me if I thought that they were going to serve fried chicken and waffles during the time that we were at the retreat. Bitch, why are you asking me? I don't, I, I'm not the chef. Why the fuck are you asking me about fried chicken? I don't know you. I don't know you. And here we are in this diverse, safe space for writers. And here I am being asked about fried fucking chicken, which I love. But why are you asking me about fried chicken right now? So I I can't just be. Here's a woman who wouldn't necessarily, I think, on an everyday basis, consider herself to be racist. I'm at a table full of white writers who I would imagine would not consider themselves to be racist. And now I'm sitting there essentially by myself as one of as uh, the only black uh, fellow sitting at the table. And what do I do? So, of course, I, I say something. But. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. That's happening to us everywhere, every day. Everywhere, every, just shit like that. Shit like that. And the other people at the table, to their credit, once I said something, they said something. Now, I don't know that anybody would have said something to her had I not initiated the conversation. I asked her, why did you ask me about fried chicken? Why are you asking me about that? And then we spent the entire time of breakfast with them drilling her about whether or not that was appropriate. And I appreciated that they spoke up, that they called bullshit on her asking me that, right? But I still was like, damn, can I just fucking eat my breakfast? It's that. That's happening at work every day, at school every day, at the store every day, all of that shit. Right. So if you can't. Don't don't ask to touch somebody's hair. Right. Don't don't do that. Don't walk up to somebody asking if they want to get jiggy or don't don't do that shit. Don't do it. Don't walk up to your black friends, pop lock in. I went to a meeting again for an organization that was for diverse voices and you know, community work, I go to a meeting and the the woman who is leading the meeting comes in and I've never had this conversation with this woman and she might be listening, right? She comes in and now there are, I think, two black people in the room when this person comes in. I am one of them. I was the youngest. The other black person was uh, mid to late 60s, right? The rest of the room, younger white folks, right? She comes in and says, hi, everybody. Sorry, I'm late. And then looks at me. Now, this is a person who I did not know and really still don't know that well, but I did not know that well. She looks at me as she drops her bag down on the table and before she sits and says, hey, okay, Phil, don't tell me anything that happened on Empire last night. And I'm thinking, bitch, why why are you asking me not to tell you what happened on Empire? I have never talked to you before. I don't fucking watch Empire. Like, what are you talking about? Why did you just point at me? And to, to, she said, don't tell me, don't tell me what happened. Now, that is not police brutality. That is not, um, that is not that. Let's be clear. I'm not saying it's the same thing, but I'm talking to the people who I rub up against, to the people who I think most of us are rubbing up against, the people who I know. We're dealing with that dumb shit and it is racist. Fix that shit. Right. I appreciate the margin. I appreciate the big shit, but fix your mouths, fix, fix yourselves. Right. 
I don't want you telling me not to tell you what happened on Empire. You don't know what I watch on the fuck. You don't know what I watch on TV. Why are you telling me that? I just got mad again thinking about it. Just why are you why are you asking me about fried chicken, bitch? Why are you asking me that? Why? Why? That's hmm. Fix that shit. We got to fix the big shit too. But I think it's all that little shit that has to get fixed as well. I am cursing. I am mad. I'm mad. I'm mad. Not about the chicken or the... I'm just mad that we have to keep talking about this shit. You know? I was maybe 25, 26 years old. I don't know. Whenever Khalees released Milkshake. Again, minding my business. I'm a fucking... I'm a... I, I am a professional at a major, I'm doing my shit. I am a professional. I'm minding my business at work. And the receptionist, a white girl who, a white woman who had just finished school um, and she was answering the phones. She yells down from the receptionist desk, down like the hallway, past about six offices. I was standing in the hallway. She had the music playing. And Khalees was on with Milkshake, whatever year that came out. Milkshake, right? We remember that song, right? And she screams to me, a black man who she don't even know. Here I go. I'm not even doing subject verb agreement right now because I'm that fucking mad. She doesn't even, she don't, she don't know me. And she says, dance. Hey, Phil, dance, dance. Like I was Bojangles. Why are you telling you dance? You the you dance. You dance. You dance for me. You you dance for me. Why are you telling me to dance? Why are you you the one listening to the shit? Why are you asking me to dance? Another company? Actually, it's the same company, different person. Minding my business, walking to the printer. I mean, just like walking. I wasn't. I wasn't pop locking. I wasn't spit. I wasn't freestyling. I wasn't doing nothing. I was walking to the printer. And I passed by um, her office, white woman, and she yells out of nowhere. Monday's Martin Luther King Day. And I'm like, why in the hell are you telling me that? Why are you? She, she, she actually, I passed by the office. She called me. She said, hey, Phil. And I leaned back and she screams that. Mar- Monday's Martin Luther King Day. Why are you telling me that? I got a calendar. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. And stop asking me to be in diversity. I don't, stop asking me to be in diversity trainings. None of us want to fucking be there. We're not the ones with the problem. Stop asking us. And black people, stop taking these damn diversity jobs. Be 5,000 white people at a company and then be one black person is the director of diversity inclusion. Stop taking those fucking jobs. It's a joke. Stop it. Stop it. Right? Stop. Y'all do some work, right? You know, do some work quietly, some quiet work, like Montessori. Just like find a work to do by yourselves, figure some shit out. Don't ask black people to dance for you randomly. Don't touch our hair. Don't kill us for just being. Don't do any of it. All of it is fucking bad. All of it. We want to be left alone. And to be honest, we might, we might even want to be, we want to be connected to you too. I'm a human being. I have people who I love who have just fucking let me down with um, the racism that just kind of pops up and that they can't even see. They're so liberal, so offended when you point it out. We can't be friends. We can't be friends. I can, we can still pass by each other. I'm not afraid of you. We can't be friends. Leave us. Take some quiet time. Uh, think about who you are. Um, yeah. 
All right. I'm going to go have a cocktail because I am worked up. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. It's hard out here in these streets right now. Um, stay, and I say, stay safe. Um, stay sane, wash your hands. Um, cause Corona still exists, y'all. COVID's still out there. I know we're going to act like it's, it's not, but it's still out there. Stay safe, stay sane, wash your hands. Let's work our way toward some kind of love for each other, some respect. Uh, I feel it. I have. I, it's there. It can be there. But we gotta. We gotta. We got. We all gotta work. We all gotta work at it. On a micro level, on an individual level, so we can shout. We can shout out to the world about what needs to change over there. Um, but we need to, myself included, handle what's happening um, within ourselves. That step, that one step, dealing with yourself would make so much of a difference um, to everyone um, that you come in contact with, to your communities, um, and to everybody. So think about it. All right, good people. I'll talk to you next time. Peace.